Hello, and welcome to JBoss AS7 and EE6. My name is Gerald, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. Now, if you experience technical difficulties during the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience. However, due to privacy rights, we have chosen to not to display the number or list of attendees to everyone on the call today. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of each portion of the presentation today. However, you may ask an online question at any time throughout the presentation today by simply typing in your question into the Q&A panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Just type your question into the text box and click Send. Please keep the Send To defaulted to all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would like to introduce you to your first presenter for today, Mr. Burr Sutter. Mr. Sutter, you have the floor. All right, thank you very much. And welcome, everybody, to today's session related to App Server 7, JBoss App Server 7, as well as EE6. We have a great lineup of presenters today. You have the absolute experts in this area ready to speak to you on these topics. And we look forward to a great session. So a couple things to just uh, uh, prepare everybody for what we're going to be doing today. JBoss.org slash AS7 is our landing page for all things AS7. You guys might have seen that already. Just bear in mind that the, um, uh, the webinar registrations are on there, including a management uh, administration operations webinar, specifically around things like clustering and how do you manage App Server 7. So I'd encourage you to register for that one if you've not already done so. I'll post the link a little bit later so into the chat panel so you'll get a chance to see what that registration link looks like. So, but bear in mind, we'll have some different pieces of content there, and as other announcements show up, you'll see that there as well. If you're interested in our overall developer webinar series, uh, and you would like to stay in the know, if you found out about this session uh, from a colleague, or maybe someone forwarded you an email, or pointed you to a website, these are the ways you would actually keep up with what's going on with JBoss, specifically for our development team to speak to your development team. We have our webinar series, and you can see jboss.org slash webinars is our homepage for that. And we'll be updating that specifically with recordings of these sessions. So we have a number of recordings. We've actually conducted um, over 21 sessions now specifically that have been recorded and are linked out there at that web webinar webpage. But you can also follow us on, at Twitter, uh, at JBoss Developer, and you will see announcements related to recordings and other new sessions show up at, uh, at JBoss Developer there. We also have an email list if you, if you prefer email as your contact uh, mechanism. You can sign up for the JBoss Developer Newsletter, and that is also linked from that webinar webpage. And all of this content shows up at Vimeo in addition to sessions we record at JBoss World or JudCon and other events that our presenters go out and do. If we can get a good developer-facing session recorded, we actually take that and put it out there at Vimeo for you guys also. So we have a ton of content. There's over 59 videos now out at Vimeo, and so that represents somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 60 hours of content, you know, 58 hours of content, something like that. And so you can have a ton of information about various topics related to maybe clustering or hibernate or seam, uh, CDI information. And of course, today's session was all about App Server 7 and EE6. So just bear in mind, we've done a number of these sessions already. This is just a continuation of what we've been doing, and we will continue moving forward with this kind of content. So on July 20th, we're going to have an OSGI deep dive with Thomas and David. So you guys are going to hear about OSGI today and, and some of the capabilities that are in AS7. That's what, you know, Jason will mention those things. But if you want a deeper dive into OSGI, I encourage you to sign up for that session. Uh, that is not yet available for registration at jboss.org slash webinars. I'll be getting that updated over the next couple days. But bear in mind that it will be coming up in a few weeks. Uh, today, it's all about AS7 and EU6 with Jason Green and Pete and Dan Allen. Okay. One thing that should be pointed out for our session we have uh, today, we're very much focused on the JBoss community side of the equation versus the JBoss enterprise side of the equation. And there is that uh, definitive line there. And we like to mention that to make sure people understand what we're here to talk about today and not to confuse people. But we're very much focused on the JBoss.org releases, specifically those projects that happen uh, within the community, working with various communities from around the, around the open source uh, ecosystem. Uh, that might be working with Eclipse and contributions we make to Eclipse or contributions we make to Glassfish or with Google and, and, and SpringSource and Apache and you name it. We work with a number of different communities out there, specifically uh, to one, we might just be simply helping them fix bugs or we might be using part of their software within our application server or our ESP or our other technology. 
And one thing to keep in mind about that is our core philosophy around those community projects is to release early and release often, to get you, the community, involved and engaged early. So it's for, by our development team, for your development team. We hope you guys participate by creating zeros if you find bugs, if you contribute documentation, uh, if you contribute you know, components to the new, uh, new project, a new component to the project. So all that happens out there at jboss.org. In many cases, you'll see forums and email lists and how you can participate there. But that, uh, our, that element of R&D is not specifically about creating enterprise class software that has, uh, has a 24 by 7 response time with a guaranteed patch fix model. So that's really on our enterprise side of the equation. So that's the JBoss EAP, Enterprise Application Platform. That's where we specifically have taken the software through a rigorous set of testing, Q&A infrastructure related to uh, certification around multiple JVMs and databases and operating systems. And we have uh, you know, created a set of software there specifically that we know we can bug fix patch in your production environment uh, for a long you know, multi-year life cycle as long as you keep that in production. So just bear in mind that we have a, you know, we're very much focused on the community side of the equation today, and we're very much focused on engaging developers and getting them access to the community uh, software and getting the adoption there. So if you have questions for today's session, as you, today's session, as you heard earlier, you can use the WebEx Q&A panel, and I put a little screenshot in here so you can see what it is. It just says Q&A. Ask your question and submit it. If we can respond to it, you will see an answer come back for everyone to see. So your question won't be immediately seen by everybody until we answer it, so just bear that in mind. And then we're also taking questions on Twitter. So if you guys have a Twitter account and you put in pound jbossas7 or hashtag jbossas7, you know, and you ask us a specific question there or you have a comment, we'll, we'll notice that. We'll be monitoring that channel as well. So feel free to you know, send us tweets along the way, and we will, um, we will queue those and ask Jason or Dan and Pete at the end of their, uh, end of their session as many of those questions as we can get in based on time allowed. So today's presenters, Jason Green is our JBoss Application Server uh, Project Lead. So Jason's been around the organization for many years now. Uh, I specifically worked with Jason way back in the day on JBoss Web Services. So I, I know he has a deep and broad uh, set of experience and, and talent and, um, and overall knowledge base when it comes to all things JBoss and specifically the JBoss application server. So he's dug deeply into things like clustering as well as uh, you know, the whole of the application server architecture and things like AOP. And he can answer pretty much any question you might have as it relates to the JBoss application server. So keep that in mind. So it's fantastic that we have Jason on board with us today. We also have Pete Muir. All right, he's led the CDI specification uh, and he specifically was the Seam project lead for a number of years and now he's working with the InfiniSpan project on open source data grid. Uh, InfiniSpan project. If you've not heard of InfiniSpan before, I encourage you to check it out. It's a great project overall from, a, from, a, a user, from what the ways you can use it, the use cases you can, use, um, uh, you can uh, fulfill with it are pretty amazing. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested in data grids overall. So we're very lucky to have Pete with us today. He's got a portion of this presentation specifically around EE6. And so he's, gonna, he's one of our best presenters and it's great to have him on board. Uh, Dan Allen, you guys might have read his Seam in Action book, and he, of course, has been associated with the Seam uh, project and Weld projects for a long time now. And Dan is by far and away our most, uh, most adventurous presenter. He's out there presenting at conferences all around the world, and so Dan is probably our number one evangelist overall, so we're very lucky to have Dan with us on today. You're going to enjoy his energy and his enthusiasm. So we have a fantastic lineup for you guys, and I encourage you guys to think about the kind of questions you might have and be prepared to send them our way. So at this point, it's time to turn it over to Jason and get it get, get it started. So Jason, please take it away. Thank you, Bert. Uh, I appreciate the uh, the generous introduction. Um, and uh, I, one thing I'd like to do is to start off by talking about you know what is JBoss Application Server Seven. Uh, JBoss Application Server Seven is a community driven open source um, server that runs Java EE six applications and it also can run um, applications that support many of our innovative APIs, such as Seam, InfiniSpan, and so on. Uh, the, the application server is something that the source code is uh, freely available, and uh, you yourself can modify and contribute patches, as well as get involved in the actual development process, um, you know, file issues, uh, come up with new ideas, 
And so that, that's when I say community driven, that's what I mean is that um, a lot, in a lot of cases our features and our approaches are driven by what you yourself are doing and um, how you want to take the project. Um, and specifically with Application Server 7, it is a um, architectural uh, genesis SSA. It's an evolution, or you could call it a revolution. Um, we are moving to a, a new, exciting model, and we view it as a sort of a new next generation of application server. Um, one thing I like to talk about is sort of differentiation between what is JBoss AS, the community version, and JBoss EAP. Um, since uh, some people that they're, they're not aware of the difference, um, so a key aspect is is that all new development happens in the community side where we bake new features, new ideas, um, and community is always cutting edge. Um, at a certain point, we then take that branch from that community version and pull it into a new enterprise branch, which undergoes a uh, variety of tests. Um, and at that point in time, we guarantee uh, backwards compatibility and um, provide a certain amount of stability. We have support for uh, you know seven-year time frames, um, and uh, so if you're deploying applications in the enterprise, then you usually want to prefer um, EAP. Now, in this case, we're talking about the community side, as Burr mentioned. So we're talking about AS7, the community release, which is uh, a foundation point that will be in the next EAP6 offering. So if you're interested in, in in EAP, everything I'm talking about today is going to be relevant later for EAP6. Now, um, there's the features that are the most interesting in AS7 is we've revamped the entire core container to be extremely efficient. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about what that means. Um, in addition, we're, we're actually completely changing the, um, the philosophy to not just be an application server that enables developers, uh, which is something we've been very good at for a long amount of time, but we actually want to um, enable administrators to make their job easier as well. So a lot of AS7 is a focus on management and administration. And uh, in particular, one of the key features is that we support um, multi, what's called domain management, which is a multi-server management capability where you can manage multiple application server VMs um, in various host topologies. Um, and this includes being able to start and stop instances, deploy applications remotely, and all those type of features that you would expect from a, a robust management system. Um, in, in addition to that, we have a number of interfaces into that management infrastructure, such as a, a command line interface that you can use, um, a native Java API. Uh, you can also use uh, JSON over um, an HTTP protocol, uh, which would allow you to do something like a Perl script to talk to the management system. Um, and we also have a, a nice uh, web-based and, and fast um, console that you can use. Um, in addition, uh, one of the things that's key to our new uh, management layer, layer and topology, as well as uh, sort of a central focus on usability with AS7, is that we now have um, a what we call user-focused configuration, and it's unified user-focused configuration. Um, and essentially what that means is that in the past, if you would look at a JBoss configuration file, you would see um, not just um, your configuration parameters, but also the server's internal wiring details. And part of the reason why it was done this way is so that you could extend JBoss in any way that you possibly could imagine. Um, now, th that is actually a great capability, and it's certainly an important capability, but um, what we found is that it's, it's actually more important to have um, configuration represent what uh, you as a user are actually trying to do so that it's easy to find config, it's easy to make those changes. Um, so essentially, we have a, a, a global rule that if something is in our configuration file, it has to be something that the user declares, not something that we would use internally to make our implementation work. Um, and also, another big exciting change is that we have what's called a pure modular class loading environment. Um, currently, uh, most application servers use a traditional Java EE um, type uh, uh, class loading architecture, which relies on um, an inheritance type model where you have, um, you know, you have one big class loader at the top, and then you have another big class loader below it, and then you automatically get all the classes in the big class loader at the top. So, um, you know, an application server that you're using, if they happen to use a particular version of a framework, then well, you get that too, whether you want it or not. So, a key feature in AS7 is that now everything is completely modular, 
and completely an isolation is taken to the highest possible level. Uh, so like as an example, a deployment can actually use its own XML parser and it's not a problem. Um, and it's something that has been an issue with, with application servers um, you know, since, since they were ro first rolled out. Um, so getting it back into this, uh, this new management capability, uh, essentially uh, we find that there's uh, different classes of users. And um, in fact, actually, at, at one of the JBoss worlds, we had a, uh, a boss where um, you know, we sat down and, and you know, discussed the various use cases. And we talked about the domain approach that we were going with. And you know, one of the things uh, we heard is that uh, there's a, there are certainly a large class of users that still like um, some of the traditional ways that we've done things. And that's something we, we felt was important, too. Um, so in this particular race, we actually um, wanted to cover both cases pretty well. So we have actually two separate modes. We have a standalone mode, which is much like traditional JBoss work, where uh, you have a single JVM. And uh, you, uh, it started basically by some sort of a shell script or an init script or whatever. And, um, and the JVM parameters and all those things are, are actually managed external to the actual application server. So that's, uh, if you use JBoss, that's what, uh, you know, that's basically how you can model this. This is how things have always worked. Um, in the new domain mode, uh, things are quite a bit different in that we have um, some processes that are around for controlling the various VM instances. And then things like JVM parameters are actually expressed in the domain configuration. Um, and the domain configuration represents any number of servers, any number of groups of servers, um, and it essentially uh, is like if you were um, in an IT group, it would represent your entire uh, infrastructure. Um, and uh, uh, one thing I'd like to note, because uh, this came up in the previous webinars, there's always a, there was a question about um, you know how does this relate to clustering and so on, and and, and this is just from for management that the two. Um, things are, are we actually treat as, as completely different notions. So you can actually use clustering and standalone as well as in domain. Um, and if you have a server group in domain, you don't necessarily have to have it be clustered. It can it can just be you know a group of, of servers. Um, but the, the important thing is that with the domain mode, you have multiple JVMs and um, they're controlled by our management infrastructure. And then you can interact it using our, those management interfaces I talked about earlier, like the APIs, the command line interface, and so on. Now, um, the, uh, if you were to actually look at what this domain topology looks like from a physical perspective, um, what I have here in this, uh, this simple diagram is multiple host boxes. And this represents um, a physical box, although it could be you know, a, a virtual machine um, instance, or it could be even um, a, a different install image. So you could actually install JBoss multiple times on the same system. You know, they could use different ports or different interfaces. And you could refer to each installed copy of JBoss on the system as a separate host. So host is basically really an isolated uh, in, uh, domain instance of, of JBoss. So in this topology, we have multiple host systems. And then we have, um, on each system, a controller process, which is called the host controller. The host controller manages multiple VMs um, for that host, so multiple server instances. Um, and you can use the server instance to represent any number of applications. Um, it gives you the possibility to represent you know, a, a, a JVM per application for like the highest level of robustness. Um, so one, if a JVM crashes, um, it doesn't take down your other applications. You know, or you could run multiple applications and just have uh, multiple uh, servers for representing different configurations. So you could have like a management, uh, sorry, a messaging server group and also a web server group and then have both of those running on you know, multiple systems. Uh, so the important thing is if you look at the little server group um, uh, dotted line here is that the server groups can span hosts. There's no requirement that a server group has to be you know, split across hosts or that it has to be located on a, on a, on a central host. The whole thing is, is that it's basically just any grouping of servers. So that's just sort of a, a reference there. Now, the important piece is that one of those hosts has uh, the master controller process, which we call the domain controller. So all domain um, interactions go through the domain controller for making changes. And then if you want to do things like query metrics or things like that, we actually uh, allow you to talk directly to the host controllers too, which, which offers the greatest value of performance. So you don't have to have everything funneling through one process. Um, but when you actually go to make writes, you make it through the, the master domain controller process. And that's how the actual process instances and the topology of that works. 
Um, so taking a step back and looking at what you get when you download JBoss AS7, um, when you extract um, the actual archive, which, by the way, uh, CR1, uh, which is a candidate release, was just released uh, less than 24 hours ago. And um, you can download that right now. And if you were to go and extract it, you would see um, things similar to past JBoss releases, like you would see this bin folder. Um, and, and one thing that you may ask if, you, if you're a past user is, well, where's my run.sh? Um, well, essentially, because we now have two separate operational modes, we've um, renamed run.sh to fit both of those modes. So we now have a standalone.sh for if, you're, if you choose to run a standalone mode. And then we have a domain.sh if you're running a full domain instance. Um, in addition, we have uh, a JBoss admin.sh script, which runs your CLI. And, um, and, uh, and there's the traditional comp file if you're using standalone mode, where this is where you would actually put your, your JVM parameters. One thing that's uh, quite a bit different with, with uh, AS7 is that we no longer have this folder that contains each profile configuration. Um, instead, we have a uh, configuration folder which contains multiple configuration files. So we no longer mix binary artifacts with the actual configuration itself. Instead, we have a, a module directory, which ties into our modular class loading. And we store every jar once. So we never have, in, in the past, we would, you would see, like, sometimes we, under that server folder, the, the multiple jar would be stored multiple times. In some cases, you could even have the class loaded multiple times, depending on how you configure things. And with AS7, now that we're purely modular, we just have a module directory. And in that, we, we contain a, um, uh, a, a directory-based uh, structure for each um, different component that, is, that makes up AS, um, what we call static modules. And then a module can contain one or more jars. It typically only contains one jar. Um, and the configuration then loads things from that module's directory. Um, so if, if you're running in standalone mode, you'll see there's a standalone directory. And things are similar to how they were before with JBoss, you, uh, you know, with the configuration for your XML files. Uh, which actually, in this case of JBoss AS7, we have a single XML file for all of your configuration, um, although you can have multiple XML files so that you can have, say, different profiles. Um, you, um, you can launch the server in different ways. That's what that's for. Um, and then we have a traditional file system-based deployment directory where you can copy deployments in there and they'll deploy. We have a logs directory like before, and then we have an internal data directory. So, um, you know, the uh, we have a H2 database that we include just for you know uh, quickly developing applications, and it, it can store data in this data folder, among other things. Um, now, one thing that's quite a bit different, though, is in a domain uh, setup, you know, you can actually have multiple servers running in the same installed image. So uh, we actually have a servers folder that then breaks out each server. So in this case, I've got server one and server two, so two different JVMs running in the same image, and they're going to have their own individual log directories and their own individual data directories. And then um, our configuration for the whole entire domain is stored in one directory, and this will contain all the details for um, you know, the, the various uh, server groups and so on. And then um, configuration settings that are specific to the host, to so the host controller, is in a separate file. Um, and you know, this would contain things like you know, exactly which interface you're binding to. And we have a variety of ways, uh, including even dynamic programmatic ways, to determine you know, which uh, network interface to use. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier, did not mention earlier about unified configuration is that since the focus is now a little bit more on the uh, administrator when it comes to uh, configuring JBoss, the, uh, we try to locate things together. So like, uh, like used to, if you wanted to change the port of something, you'd have to dig through all of our configuration files and find the right service for what that port is. And in, in, in AS7, we now actually co-locate all that together based off of the type of resource. So you know, there's a section in the configuration file that these are all my ports. So you can quickly know what all your ports are, and then you can quickly adjust them. And then we have the ability to do like port offsets and things like that. Um, and if you're interested in a lot more details on this, I highly recommend um, attending uh, tomorrow's presentation with uh, Brian Stansberry, where he delves fully into the whole domain architecture. Um, so as I also mentioned, um, we moved away from putting implementation details in our actual configuration. So in this case, uh, I've got a nice little example of our transaction manager service. And I, it actually goes on quite a bit longer than just this little snippet here. But the part that you see that's X'd out, you'll notice that 
there's a lot of stuff in here that you really just don't care about. Like, you know, you can see all this AOP annotation stuff that's embedded in an XML file, and then you'll notice that you have property values that are detyped, um, you know, which doesn't allow you to do things like have completion in your in your you know favorite XML editing tool. So um, instead, we change things to where we now have thing everything every configuration value is completely user focused, and the actual configuration parameters are all typed to an XML schema. Um, and then each subsystem, which I'll talk a little bit more about what a subsystem is, um, gets its own schema and its own settings. So in this case, our transaction subsystem has a few, you know, a few parameters that you can set, notably what the socket bindings are. And, this, and these are our IDs that are stored in that unified socket area that I was just talking about. So. Um, you know, if you looked in that socket section, you would see TXN socket process ID, and then there would be some socket number that it would use. Uh, so, you know, we, we, fundamentally what we believe is that by, by doing this, we've actually improved the, the workflow in which you use JBoss, and um, things will be much more easier to figure out and, and learn and discover, you know, as opposed to having to you know, sort of, uh, you know, dig in every time you want to try to figure something out. Um, so, so you may be wondering now, how did we um, achieve all of the, you know, these, these aggressive changes? You know, I, I mentioned we've got great performance. Um, we've got, you know, great management capabilities. How, what's, the, what's the fundamental architecture that drives this? Um, so uh, the key thing is, is that we have a, uh, we've, we've, when we re-looked at things, we, we noticed that there's a trend in, and that computing power is no longer based off of just raw frequency. Um, you know, in the past, everybody had a single core CPU, and then you know, it seemed like every other week there would be you know a processor that was twice as fast as the previous one. Um, you know, because they would just double the clock rate. And uh, nowadays, that's no longer the case. Now um, we're in a multi-core world, um, and uh, the key to taking advantage of current modern hardware is actually having parallel programming and concurrent programming. So JBoss AS7 is designed around the whole thing being as concurrent as possible. Um, so, th so the way we do that is we have a new kernel layer that's called the modular service container, which is a fully concurrent um, service container kernel. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In, in addition, we have a um, extremely optimized modular class loading layer, which is driven by the JBoss modules project. And this is an independent project that you can use outside of AS if you choose. Um, for our management APIs, we have something called uh, DMR, which stands for uh, D-Type um, Model Representation. And, and essentially what this is is we wanted the management APIs to be as usable as possible by as many languages as possible, as well as also being forward and backwards compatible. Uh, so the DMR um, component of the core AS7 architecture basically um, where it does, takes what you would use in a, in a dynamic programming language like Perl or Ruby or so on um, and takes that, those dynamic type notions and brings it into Java um, so that uh, uh, you, know, you work in these data structures that can have uh, automatic type conversion and things like that. So uh, it makes it really easy to then send a management request from any of those types of languages and, and then it also allows us to, to you know, have a great level of backwards compatibility. Um, in addition, we have a lot of uh, uh, you know interesting capabilities around um, how we manage thread pools. Um, one of the most common problems in application servers is that you have um, some component or library that decides to use a bunch of thread locals and it leaks a bunch of memory, and those never get cleaned up. Um, and we have a component which actually uses um, an internal JVM hook to to reset that state so that you have less. Uh, you know, problems with, with things of that nature. So if you have a hostile library, it doesn't, uh, you know, leak your application server. Um, and, uh, you know, another big piece of having our performance uh, that we have is that, um, you know, ever since things move to annotation processing, for an application server to understand how a deployment works and how to start it, it actually has to dig into the deployment. It has to actually analyze all the class files and figure out, you know, what things are connected to. So uh, this is actually a very time-consuming process when you have thousands of classes or you have hundreds of jars or thousands of jars that each have hundreds of thousands of classes. Um, so uh, we have a component called uh, Jandex, which actually indexes all the annotations on the fly. And uh, you can even use this, 
this component outside of, of AS to pre-compile all of your annotations, um, such that when you deploy on AS7, it will discover that and uh, not even bother looking at your classes. But one of the key things it does is it actually can read the class file format and skip things that are of not, not of interest, so it can try and read annotations as, as fast as possible. Um, and then we have some things like, uh, you know, in, just due to the nature of the way Java EE works and all the dynamic capabilities, uh, uh, Java Reflection is heavily used, and Java Reflection is not the most performant thing uh, in the world. So we have um, a reflection cache that we use internally um, so that um, whatever any of our libraries decides to, to look up um, information about your classes, um, it can actually reuse previous information that was done. And that's another key element to why we have the performance that we do. Um, and uh, really, the interesting part of the architecture it comes from uh, the subsystems themselves. And a subsystem is, is something that defines some kind of enterprise capability. It's also an extensibility point into the application server. So as you can see, connector, data source, EE, EGB3, and so on, these are all things which are subsystems. And these can be added and removed as you please. Um, uh, this allows you to have even greater performance than what we have right now. Um, you know, although many of you will find that, hey, just include everything because you know we start so fast that it, it doesn't matter. But you ha you still have that configuration flexibility, and you can also use this yourself if you want to build on the application server. So if you were to write your own subsystem, um, you know, uh, you would immediately gain access to all these features that we have, like that uh, the domain topology configuration and management. So if you you know if, if you are a third party provider, you want to provide some component. Uh, into AS7, you can do that, and then um, everybody gets the main management for your configuration um, because it's a subsystem. So uh, w one thing you may wonder is, okay, so what's so great about this uh, concurrent service architecture, and, when, and, and actually, what is a service? Um, why do I care about this? So a service is basically anything that has a life cycle. It's something that you can start and stop. Um, and, you know, and a key aspect of services is that they have some relationship to another service. Um, so there's, you know, you can't start something until you start something it uses. So like if you have something like an like a, a, an EJB, which is actually internally modeled as a service, if it needs to use a transaction, it has a dependency on our transaction manager, right? So we can't start that EJB until the transaction manager is started. So uh, essentially, it's the finest grained components that we use to represent any type of any type of core concept that has a start and stop. So um, in your application, all EE components that you have, you know, EJB, serverless, management, et cetera, those are all internally as wired as services. And then what uh, MSC does, what our concurrent service container and kernel architecture does, is it tries to solve the problem of how do I start your application um, without, um, you know, starting before your dependencies are available and starting it still in parallel. So it tries to, basically what it does is it, it, it uses the dependency information that you provide, you know, either implicitly through annotation, so like you have, say, an EJB reference in your, as an annotation in your application to another deployment. Um, it uses this information to construct dependencies. And then once it has those dependencies, it then executes everything in parallel um, and then um, orders things in such a way that it will always start in that, that correct dependency ordering. So it's actually a really complicated problem to solve, and we solved it. And what this allows you to do is it means that in AS7, not only does it start insanely fast, but you can deploy applications in parallel. So when you deploy multiple things, they'll actually start at the same time. And if they happen to use a piece of each other, only the thing inside that deployment that uses the other one will block on only the thing that it's using. So you know, if you happen to have one bean referencing one bean, the whole deployment doesn't wait till the other one starts. They both start together. Um, so. Um, I have some extra technical details for you, uh, which will be in the presentation you can download, which is here. Uh, I won't go too much into them, other than to say that our service container architecture is extremely flexible. We've got um, on-demand um, capabilities, lazy capabilities. Uh, we have um, you know, the ability to dynamically generate services. We've got child services, a whole set of slew of features um, um, that uh, you know, if you have more interest, you can check out. And um, this is essentially how everything is modeled. And it brings us into the next problem, which is, well, how, how are classes loaded? Because class loading is actually one of the big issues with um, an application server. And it's, it's certainly a performance impacting thing. So um, uh, one of the biggest advantages of modular class loading um, that, that, that you will notice, um, aside from the performance benefits, is that um, it, you have the ability to 
not necessarily use the inheritance style model that you may be used to. You have the ability to use a much more natural model. Um, if you've worked in an IDE, pretty much all IDEs work this way. Um, you know, Eclipse, uh, and, and IDEA, and so on. Um, they have this notion of you, you create a project, and then in your, in your project, you can then specify that uh, dependency, so you say this, this project uses this other project. And um, your classes that are imported and seen, they're, they're all defined this way. So there's no, like, in your ID, you don't have, like, some hierarchy kind of thing where you have to put the stuff that you want in the top one so that it comes down to the bottom one. That's not how you think at all. Instead, you're like, okay, well, I've got a core project, and now I've got a web project, and my web project uses the core project. So that is how we do class loading in AS7. Um, and the thing that provides that is JBoss modules. So in JBoss modules, uh, a module is some, a definition of one or more jars and in that, you can refer to your dependencies on other modules. Um, so you, just in the same way that I described using projects in, in an ID, you would do that with um, AS7. And, uh, and you can put these uh, descriptor elements in your deployments, or you can use our static module repository to have things. Um, now, a key thing of this is that the uh, dependency resolution in JBoss modules is designed to be very fast. It loads classes in 01 time, you know, the constant time. It, we have the support for uh, concurrent class loading, so two classes can be loaded at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an incredibly tiny project. And, um, and, and as I mentioned, you can use it outside of AS7 uh, if you wanted to. Um, and another interesting aspect in, in AS7 when it comes to class loading is that we have um, support for OSGI. So you can deploy OSGI bundles. If you download AS7 and throw a bundle in there, you'll notice that, hey, it works. Um, and this OSGI was actually built off of our JBoss modules and MSC architecture, and that has actually led to our OSGI uh, implementation being very fast. Um, and it also allows us to integrate EE and OSGI in various interesting ways. Um, so moving on, um, I mentioned I keep saying we have fast performance, and uh, people wonder, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, what we actually um, have achieved is essentially a, a tenfold um, plus performance improvement in boot time. Um, and uh, you can see the numbers here. I've got AS6 and the EP5. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially, if you launch AS on any modern system, you'll notice that it boots, you know, um, you know in, in around three seconds. Uh, in, in this particular bench, uh, benchmark I was doing, it, it booted in, uh, in 2.1. Um, and if you run in 32-bit uh, mode you, you, with your JVM, um, you can actually achieve even more performance on, on boot time, which is why I've got that AS7. Um, 32 there. So this really is a dramatic improvement in uh, startup performance, and it enables a whole new way of thinking about things. Um, and, and not only did we heavily improve boot time by doing this, we also uh, completely <laughs> or heavily reduced our memory consumption in the application server to such an extent now that, that you can run on tiny devices. Um, so, you know, as before, we used to use hundreds hundreds of megs of memory, and now we use a handful of megabytes of memory. Um, so this is something that actually has a dramatic effect, and it also has an effect on um, your runtime performance of your application and the startup performance of the container, because the more memory you use in Java, the more work the garbage collector has to do, and also the more work the OS has to do. So good, low memory usage is good in just about every possible way. Uh, so that's another factor in why we have great performance. So I mentioned that there's this whole new realm of possibilities by having um, fast startup time and low memory usage. Uh, essentially, you can now think of problems different ways. And I, I always relate it to, um, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with the Git uh, version control system, um, I think it's a great way to manage um, code and code changes. We use it in AS7. Moving from CVS to Git is such a dramatic change, you know, especially around performance, that your workflow becomes completely different because, uh, you know, you, so more possibilities are out there. Um, and, and, you know, in particular, like with AS7 now, I mean, why not just run your application server in a unit test? I mean, if it starts in two seconds, you know, well, you know why do you have to kick it off as a separate thing and, and run a test? Now you can have a very simple approach of prototype your application, deploy it, run it right now, um, in one test. Now, uh, you know, other possibilities happen, like, um, now the memory use is just so low, you can have you know hundreds of, of VMs on a system without a problem. So why not just use a VM per application? You get the highest possible level of robustness. One application cannot take down the other application. Um, 
uh, why not run your software in a smaller, more constrained environment? Uh, you can run on mobile devices now because when you use a handful of megs of, of memory, um, you know there's so many more possibilities. Uh, you know, in addition, um, you can now use cloud more often because you know when when you when you run your applications in, in a cloud environment, you're usually getting billed by your you know your resource usage, how much time, how much processing time did you use, and then you know you know it can also factor as to what level of, of virtual machine are you using in that cloud environment. You know, do you have a slower virtual machine? Um, so there's much more possibilities um, in uh, having that uh, less resource usage. So now you can now you can use twice as much as you were using before because now you have uh, much more runtime uh, performance at your disposal. Um, and another thing is that it just emphasizes rapid development because when, when you can start your app server this fast, um, you can now write code, um, deploy your application, start it, see what happens, stop it, write code, you know, and repeat and rinse and repeat every single time. And, and this is just a whole new way of doing things that, that I think you'll find that it, that, that uh, no longer is Java EE this, uh, this, uh, this involved multi-step process. Now it's this like lightning fast thing. And you know, if you can run all these VMs on your, on your laptop now because they use so little memory and start so fast, um, now you can have multiple staging environments. I mean, why not? Why not have production, tests, all kinds of stuff running on your system on your laptop while you're at a conference? Um, I mean, it's just a great new way of looking and solving problems that you're facing today. Um, so I, I want to show you a little demonstration um, uh, before we get to uh, Q&A. But uh, I, I just like to plug once again that we released CR1 less than 24 hours ago, and you can get it right now. This is the candid release for AS7.0. And uh, it will be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, it will be uh, promoted to uh, our final release. Um, you know, provided that there is no major, uh, you know, regressions the community uncovers. So we're very close to having a final release right now. So I highly recommend taking it for a spin, um, seeing how your applications work, and uh, you know, letting us know what you think. Uh, so let, let, let me move on now to showing you a, uh, a small demonstration of the app server. Um, so essentially, uh, I've got a small checkout here, and you can see JBoss uh, 7 CR1, and I can quickly start that up. And uh, I just switched to WebEx, so it'll probably have a little bit slower boot time. Oh, actually, it's pretty fast. Um, so 2.3 seconds, we've started a full EE web profile um, application server. and now I have a, a simple application. This is just a simple Fibonacci application um, with uh, EJBs and a WAR with some serverless to access that. So um, I can now fire up the, uh, the new um, CLI interface and uh, connect to my running application server, which is running in standalone mode, by the way. Um, and I can deploy my application. Now, if you're a fan of Unix-type environments, which I am, I, you know, um, then uh, then you'll notice little things that we've done that make the, the things friendlier. Like, for example, uh, tab completion works. So I can I can tab complete my deployment on this local on the file system. I can deploy it. Um, you know, it becomes active on the server. You know, extremely quickly. And uh, you know, I can actually go. Let's actually look at the application here. See that it's running. Um, so you know, this is just simple uh, Fibonacci sequence that it generates. Um, and if I'm done using the application, I can. I can undeploy it, and uh, one of the interesting things is tab complete works here too. So uh, I can undeploy it here, and oops, get out of this. Go to my web server, and you'll notice that it's no longer there. Now, uh, if you don't want to use the CLI, maybe maybe you're uh, a fan of web interfaces. Um, you may be interested in trying out our administration console. So you can go to the main splash page, click on the administration console. Um, go into manage deployments here, and we can pick. Let's see here, da, 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 Cibo.ear, and we are going to deploy that. And um, one of the things that's a little bit different is that it stages the deployment, so you can decide. Okay, now I want it to actually go live. So uh, we then deploy here, and as you can see, it's deployed. Um, the application is working again, um, and we can now. Go back, and we can remove the deployment, 
and it's gone. Now, uh, you may be thinking, okay, that's great, but I, mean, I really love a traditional file system-based deployment, and well, that still works too. You can just do copy uh, fibo.ear into the uh, deployments directory, and we'll notice that the deployment uh, scanner will pick it up as soon as it notices it and deploys the application, and um, again, once again, going to it, I can actually execute the, the servlet, and it works just fine. So um, that's just a little, just a little taste of things. Um, I highly recommend staying for Pete and Dan's presentation. They demo um, not only uh, more, more interesting applications, but also um, uh, how you actually develop them and using the cool EE6 technologies like um, the CDI specification for injection. So um, with that, I will um, pass this back to Bird. Um, should we do a question and answer session? Yeah, that was fantastic, Jason. Thank you very much for the demonstration. I think people really enjoyed that. It makes the uh, overall presentation much more concrete when they can kind of see things in action, that fast startup time and the ability to load an application through the CLI or through the web interface. And there was actually one question we already received, specifically around unified configuration and what, the, what that means. Uh, if you could go in a deeper, a little bit deeper dive on what unified configuration means, and they specifically asked, is there a GUI, which they just saw the GUI, for, for managing uh, their configuration. Yes, so unified uh, configuration is actually an overloaded term in AS7. It means, first and foremost, that all your configuration is in one spot, uh, so it's all unified in one single place. So like if you're looking at it from the XML point of view, it's one single XML file. Uh, if you're looking at it from a different management um, view, say coming in from the CLI, uh, it, it's uh, one, the same one configuration view for the whole thing, so there's not, there's not multiple uh, there's not multiple places where your configuration is stored. Um, in addition, it also means that all of our different um, interfaces, the command line interface, the Java API, uh, the administration console, they all see the same data. They all have the same capabilities. Um, so um, basically, the whole entire architecture of the app server is built off of management at the core. Anything that you can configure in XML, you can manage um, via any of these, of these interfaces. Oh, very good. Does, uh, does the app server still uh, support exploded wars? It's a very popular way to deploy applications in old AS6 and AS5 and AS4. You know, what about exploded wars and exploded archives? Yes. In fact, uh, exploded is something that we offer in um, standalone mode. Um, and the reason why it's not in domain mode is because um, it doesn't always make a lot of sense because you, you typically if you're using it in a domain mode, you've got servers you're controlling on different host systems and so having an exploded directory uh, you know, local on your system, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But in the standalone case, if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're a local developer, you're just trying to launch JBoss, develop your application, deploy it from an IDE, and you want to um, change static resources and things like that, you know, then, uh, and then yeah, that's supported uh, just as it was before. All you do is you just, you just copy that directory into that deployments directory. Um, and one interesting thing about Explode Deployments that we solved in this release is that, um, uh, in the past, you may have noticed that if, depending on when you copy, the, the, the scanner can pick it up in the wrong point in time, and you know things can break. Um, so, and, and this, you know, has resulted in like JBoss tools using all kinds of workarounds, like um, actually connecting into JBoss and trying to disable the deployment scanner so that the copy takes place. You know, if it's like a large directory that you're copying across partitions or something like that. Um, and now in in, uh, in AS7, um, what we actually do is we we use a marker file to indicate, so you copy your deployment out there, and then you use a marker file uh, to say, okay, now actually make it go live. Um, so you just touch a file or, you know, or create it if you're, you know, in your GUI interface. Um, and then if you don't like that, if you don't like that staging notion that we have, we actually have a, a setting that you can set that goes back to the traditional way. A little bit riskier, pick it up as soon as you think it can, but you, know, you still have that problem where if you're not doing an atomic move, to deploy the explode deployment that uh, you know it may not pick up uh, in the way that you want it. And we have a great question that came in, uh, some great comments that came in on Twitter. JBoss AS7 looks to be the best application server in the world. Boot time and memory consumption are just amazing. That came in from Jeremy on Twitter. But a question that came in on Twitter was, what's with the right uh, white rabbit? Is that an Alice in Wonderland or a Matrix reference? It's actually a dual reference. Um, uh, in, in a way, we're just sort of uh, uh, poking fun at the uh, well, the matrix there is the matrix element was kind of nice because if you if you are a JBoss user, it goes way back. We used to code name all of our releases with matrix characters, um, 
so that was certainly an element that, that came into it when we, when we came up with the White Rabbit name. Um, but it was also uh, an Alice in Wonderland reference. And really, what we we're uh, what happened is, is if you look in Jira, we had planned to release CR1 a little bit earlier than we did. Um, I think it was delayed about two weeks total time. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you know, White, White Rabbit is always concerned about being late. So that was uh, sort of poking fun at that. Um, um, and, and we just thought the name sounded nice. And it gives us a, lo a lot of interesting things to say, like follow the white rabbit. Um, and so that's why we thought of it. So I hope you like the code name. <laughs> and another great question. One of, the, one of the historical claims to fame for JBoss overall is the ability to you know, pick and choose from a subsystem standpoint what features or what services do I want within my application server. Is there, um, how do I turn on and off subsystems in XML? Uh, and is there a UI way of handling it as well? Right. So it, uh, there, uh, the answer is you, in the UI, you can do that by just uh, there's a there's a way that you can just remove a subsystem. Um, the typical way to, to actually is to get rid of services is just completely take the whole subsystem out, um, just remove it from the XML file. Um, we do allow you to various various configuration options. You can disable um, you know certain certain finer grain elements of the subsystem. But what we encourage people to do is to just um, you know, just take the starting XML file and then just delete stuff you don't want. And the nice thing about the way we organize the configuration file is that um, since it's all structured by subsystem, it's incredibly easy to remove and add things. Um, you know, it's not like it was before where if you remove one thing over here, you have to go find something else over there that uses it. And the only way you know is by booting and seeing the error message, which was kind of cryptic. Um, and one of the things we've, we've tried to do, and it's certainly something that we uh, plan to uh, put a little bit more effort into it in the next 7.1 release is have such that subsystems automatically handle the case of something that they may use not being available. So like, for example, if you remove the transaction subsystem, the EJV subsystem um, can cope with it not existing and can say, okay, well, yeah, you can still use EJVs, but you don't have uh, transactions available. So um, you know, we're really trying to take that uh, ability to find and finally remove services uh, you know, as far as we can. Okay. And we have mo uh, one more moment. Let's take one final question there. Uh, and actually, the team, while you're here talking, we're talking or answering the questions in the background. One more that I think is very pertinent for everybody, and it's really good if you dr uh, drill down on this, is one of our big problems with JBoss is that it shipped with a lot of libraries. Obviously, a lot of jars come in JBoss overall. Is it possible in JBoss 7 to deploy a war to include a different version of a jar file, you know, specifically bundle bundling in, let's say, the Hibernate jar with my war file? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, essentially, what we've done is we've, with modular class learning, is we've allowed you to really take um, uh, isolation as far as you want. Um, so uh, um, we have a implicit uh, dependency on the hybrid APIs that comes in um, for users that really like having um, hibernate available. Um, but we have a mechanism by which you can disable that if you choose, um, and you can use your own. Uh, you can use your own hibernate. It's not a problem. Um, and um, you know, there was a mention about having too many jars um, in, in, your, in your deployments. And this is a whole new possibility with AS7 is, is you can actually take advantage of our static, static module layer. Um, earlier I mentioned that we ourselves only store one jar once. Um, you can actually take advantage of this too. So you can actually take libraries that you use in all your various applications and you can create like compatibility streams. So you could have say like a, uh, you know, like a struts one module and you can have like a struts two module and then you can have you can and you can update those two static modules and it will ripple to all the, the deployments that use them. And then in your deployments instead of using the traditional EE ways of referring to those libraries, you can just add a, uh, either an XML descriptor or you can add a, a meta inf property in your manifest uh, that says uh, I have a dependency on this static module and you'll get those classes. So um, so so yeah, I mean we basically want to enable um, you know you to have the ability of not having to, like if you have, say, a security concern where you need to update um, a library that you're using, and then you have, say, you know, a, a lot of our customers have something like, you know, thousands of applications all using, you know, various versions of the, of the component, you know, and you have to go and find where all of them are, um, you know, you can take advantage of this, of this module layer to where you only have to update it in one place. Okay, and we're basically out of time. There are a couple more questions, though, related to logging, some backward compatibility questions. So what we'll do is, Jason, if you don't mind, when we're going to take a little bit of a break here. So for everybody on the phone, we're going to take a little bit of a break so you guys can go uh, have a bio break. You can guys grab another cup of coffee, et cetera. Jason can answer some of the questions via the Q&A panel, so you'll see his question answers pop up. 
in the answer session there, or some of our other guys, Andrew, Dan, or Pete, will be answering questions. And then we're going to start up in just a few more moments with the Dan and Pete show talking about EE6, and you're going to have a lot of great demonstrations you're going to see from Pete there. Uh, so, Jason, thank you very much. Great demonstration, great presentation. And one, thank you, one point, and one uh, final point, uh, as Andrew points out here, uh, specifically questions around the enterprise version of AS7, EAP6 is what it will be called and titled. Um, and EAP6, you can certainly contact your uh, Red Hat representative to get more information about EAP6 and when that will be fully supported for the enterprise. But look for that at the beginning of next year, beginning of 2012. That's the approximate time frame for that. Right now, um, we're very much focused on the next delivery of AS7.0. Right, Jason? That will be coming out shortly. And then, of course, you also have a plan for 7.1. Exactly. Uh, I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, essentially, 7.0 is a release that targets the uh, the web profile plus uh, JAXR, uh, JAXRS, REST, EV, and um, JCA. And in addition, we have um, a, a profile that you can enable that, that gives you access to to uh, JMS and, and web services. Um, but it, it is targeted at the at the web profile level of the E specification. In 7.1, we are doing the full profile, which will gain access to all the legacy components if you have applications that are using things like CMP and so on, um, that that's coming in in 7.1. And then EAP6 is going to be based off of, off of 7.1. Um, and and 7.1 is targeted for uh, late fall of this year. All right, fantastic. So let's take about a four-minute break. I'm actually going to send everybody a link for all the attendees and panelists right now if, you have, if you're interested in reading something. And that is related to JBoss Tools support. If you're interested in Eclipse plugins, and using Eclipse with your App Server 7. That was also released today from a blog from Max Anderson. I'll post that in the chat so you guys can be perusing that information while we take a quick break. So about, we'll be right back on in about four minutes.